Okay, um, thank you very much for the, for the opportunity to, as you see, I'm going to be speaking on the, uh, the use of the planning system to secure health and well-being. And I'm particularly pleased to be here because I haven't been out and about much in the last few days, so I was afraid to come out after Wales speak Northern Ireland, but I'm, this is my first appearance since, so no heckling, please. Um, I'm going to talk through, there's a, a briefing paper to go with this, so I'm going to, what seems like a generalisation, but if you look at the briefing paper, there's a indication to quite a lot of science that's behind and evidence that's now coming out about actually the links between essentially the built environment and our health and well-being. Uh, and that's what I'm going to be largely talking about. I'll very quickly talk about those, those impacts and then come to what I see as nine points to actually make the Northern Ireland planning system more supportive of good health. So I'll start here by making what might seem like an obvious point, but it seems to be lost largely if you look at the planning system, that actually, on the one hand, we shape place, which is largely what the planning system is, is largely about. We, we seem to be focusing on how, how we do that. But we don't maybe take enough reflection of how actually the places shape us. And that happens in many, many ways. Uh, it's a psychological aspect, it's physical health, mental health, all sorts of things. And I'll just focus on that, the implications of actually maybe neglecting the second part of that first sentence, in which way, in what ways have places shaped us, particularly over the last 50 years. Particularly, I'll focus then on actually the health challenges. And many of you that are familiar with the planning system will know that actually it was born itself out of a, um, a, a concern with health in the emergence of industrialization in the UK, and particularly health of slum housing, poor air quality, uh, and particularly water. And that was the impotence for the planning system, essentially. We had a planning system, and actually through the intervention of public health and planners, we've probably saved millions and millions of lives in the UK and Europe through those interventions, arguably even more than the NHS. But actually, our health challenges continue, and the main argument that I'll be making and be made by many more, that actually our key health challenges for the Western society, Northern Ireland including, are now actually largely lifestyle and environmental issues, which actually the planning system have, have many uh, controls over, and I'll give an example of that in a minute. So uh, those are some sort of general contextual things. Northern Ireland is a particular example of this. It has its own health profile coming out of our lifestyle choices, our geographical conditions. And I don't want to uh, be overly critical because there are some very good things going in Northern Ireland that do help support this, this agenda, which I'll, I'll touch to. Greenway development, cycling strategies, and the activities of quite a few organizations such as Belfast Healthy Cities. So I'll maybe come back to some of those good examples. But in terms of the health profile, this is a, a very, all I'll touch on, this is a, a graph uh, that was from the, the Lancet in 2013. And this shows the burden of disease in the UK. Essentially, lives lost in the UK, uh, amount of costs and so on. It's all rolled up as an indicator. And you can see these are the risk factors. And as, as you would likely see, the, the key risk factors are what we could roll into the, the lovely world called, word called smoker diabetes, which essentially smoking, uh, physical activity, unhealth, and, uh, overweightness, and so on. But if you actually look down the top ones, that group of the, the top three, uh, the, out of the top four, three of those are environmentally linked or closely environmentally linked, as I'll explain. Uh, high body mass instead of physical activity are very closely linked to our lifestyle and environment. Uh, air quality is a key contributor and lead exposure is a key quality. So out of the, the total health burden faced by the UK, some of the very main ones, not all of them by any means, are actually very closely linked to how we have shaped our built environment. And of course, there's very major uh, 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 environmental, economic, and clearly very personal costs that goes along with those health benefits. Just a, a definitional issue, when I talk about health, it's not merely the absence of those. So we're not just treating illnesses, but actually the World Health Organization for a long time has defined it much more broadly as a state of physical, mental, and social well-being. So it's not just an absence of, of illness, which essentially is what the planning system was focused on to begin with, but actually a much more rounded sense of well-being. 
and we're tending to use the word well-being more and more, and actually the current programme for government, or the draft programme for government, tends to reflect that as well, a well-being approach. And this actually uh, maybe slips close definition. Maybe that's why the programme of government's using it. I don't know. Uh, the, the New Economics Foundation has tried to define it, and it's often quoted as being feeling good and functioning well. And again, that's an even broader sense than the WHO's definition of health. So we actually talk about things of feelings of happiness, contentment, enjoyness, curiosity, and engagement. So actually, that's much more broad. And as I'll come on to say, actually, well-being is currently at least referenced in the current uh, Planning Act. So actually, at least planners do at minute should be having a, a relationship to well-being, even if it's not very well defined. <coughs> So just to echo some things I've said already, I suppose, in putting what, how health has been considered in the planning system. The planning system came out of very progressive roots. It was a program for social welfare, seeing on, on all the, the environmental and social distress of the industrialization. It started statutorily anyway over 100 years ago. And uh, as I said, probably millions of lives have been saved by that intervention. It became, I suppose, embedded in state activities after the Second World War, and it more or less coincided with the adoption of the NHS. And planning was then, and it's not now, seen as a very strong component of the welfare state. So actually, we had the NHS to treat people who were ill, and planning, as well as other welfare components, were there to actually make people's lives better. So it's, there's a, a, a very attractive idealism and progressivism progressivism to the idea of planning. I suppose the downside of it is, since the state has taken it over, we've had a, a slow ebbing away of the social objectives of planning. And we've put this down to a rise of technical professionalism. The state has taken over, it's become bureaucratized, and we've seen social objectives seep away. And particularly over the last 15 years with the growth of neoliberalism and the rise of economic paradigms that actually we've seen that planning has become more about actually the property than the people that it's supposed to serve. So that puts it in a very difficult situation. And I think no more better highlighted than actually, if you look at the planning legislation of Northern Ireland, if there's one definition of what it should be delivering, it's here. It's a complicated document, but it's there to secure the orderly, consistent and consistent development of land. And to me, that's rather perverse, and it's been there since the Northern Ireland planning system started, as far as I know, because that says nothing about the outcomes for people. It, what I, I'm not sure what, what it would look like, uh, an orderly and consistent development. It doesn't actually say anything about how it would be, benefit the people that live in a neighbourhood or even the houses that would be developed. So I'll come back to, to that, and I think that is, is very um, symbolic of how planning has almost lost its social objectives and... I'll come to show why it needs actually to, to recover those. So if I take very briefly and uh, apologise for this slight simplification of how health and the built environment are currently interlinked. Well, traditionally planning has seen the built environment, health in the built environment, I suppose in terms of the, just the avoidance of infectious diseases, toxic substances and physical harm. That's why we had, you know... Um, space standards, good air quality, uh, um, water sanitation, and so on, on the, the forefront of planning. But actually, those issues have been achieved largely in Western society. They haven't in the global south, maybe. But now, actually, the health threats are coming from a different thing. And if we take that, that definition of, of health, we're not quite touching those things. So some of the, the main links between health and the built environment are air quality, and we're seeing increasing concern about the levels of this. Clearly, the, the, the recent uh, issues of Volkswagen and other car dealers is, is, is one issue that's coming to the fore. But it's been estimated in the UK that actually 40,000 UK deaths are attributed to poor air, um, air quality every year. Pro rata, that's about 2,000 people in Northern Ireland dying just from air quality alone. Diesel cars, oil-centred heating are some of the key issues. And those clearly aren't equitably defined across Northern Ireland. It's in the inner city with people driving in that we find the worst air quality. So there's an equality issue there as well. We'll all be aware of uh, obesity and inactivity issues. 
So 24% of men and 21% of women in Northern Ireland are obese. Um, and that's linked to a very major range of health issues, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, arthritis, depression, and many, many more. And that's estimated to actually cost just obesity to cost Northern Ireland £370 million per year. So we're talking about stacking up very, very substantial costs as a result of the, the health impacts of the built environment. That's related to the built environment, as I'll come on to show, because actually the way we've structured our cities over the last 50 years has actually is one of the ways that we've been discouraged by being uh, active, car dependency, and so on. And actually, if it's the route to health, we've seen that the, the UK medical officers called physical activity, of which actually planning has tried to discourage, as a miracle cure for a whole range of symptoms, which I'll come on to very soon. Planning is a close link to that. Access to open and green space is a, maybe a little bit more obvious. If we live near parks, science has shown us that we actually have more increased physical activity. Uh, people who live nearer parks have lower body mass index, uh, less uh, obesity. And people that live in greener environments have much better uh, mental well-being while trees and so on uh, help with fog, dust, and many, many other issues. I'm sure many of you are aware of that, and there's a rich science to back that. This is a very quick profile of uh, the physical activity of people in Northern Ireland. Uh, on average, 33% um, uh, of adults, 33% uh, of men um, uh, only meet, meet the recommended activity levels, which is 150 hours of physical activity a year, 28% in Northern Ireland. You can see there's a, a very distinct urban-rural difference as well, largely, I would suggest, uh, built related to actually the nature of the built environment in which we live. This is a, a, a map from some research I've done that actually there's a lot of work done recently on what makes a city or a built environment walkable. And there's a whole a lot of work going on that actually people who live in what we call more work, walkable environments tend to have substantially lower body mass index. And this is calculated by a mix of land, mixture of land uses, the connectivity of the built environment, density, and so on. If you put all those things together, this is the pattern of walkability you get in, in Belfast. And um, in some ways, there's no surprising. The, the, the low-density ring on the outside, I suppose, is what you would expect. But what is interesting, too, I could talk a little bit about this, but there's a couple of features that are very interesting. One is the city centre is very poorly walkable, partly because low population density. And also, the, the ring of uh, major urban housing that we've built since we've had the planning system are low walkable. And the only high walkable is a ring, really, essentially Victorian uh, parts of the, the city. And a, a very simple conclusion to that is where we have rebuilt the city since the birth of the planning system, the city centre and the outlying suburbs, actually we've reduced walkability and with that consequences for, for health, at least indirectly. So I'll come back to that. The other health impacts, again, I'll run through this quite clearly, quickly from the built environment, is social exclusion and poverty. Uh, clearly, uh, we've got a very, very strong social gradient of health. Those people that live in more deprived areas of the city have genuinely very poor uh, health compared to the, the most affluent, and actually that's reflected on life expectancy, which I'll show you in a minute. And that's linked not to sort of air quality, but a whole range of things like access to job opportunities that has health consequences, uh, access to food, good food and so on, which I'll touch on. There's a whole range of inequalities tied up with environmental injustices. Mental health is linked to the built environment, so aspects such as poor housing, neighbourhood noise, uh, poor levels of daylight, pollution, fear of crime, overcrowding and a lack of escape facilities, that is trees and um, parks and so on, can really compound mental health problems. And again, there's inequalities of those across the city. And last is access to health care and other services, which in some ways is seen as a more traditional planning issue. If you can walk to a GP, get access to health service, you're more likely to go. But also access to a whole range of other health supporting features, uh, neighbourhood uh, services, good food, and so on, which I'll talk about in a little while. So just to illustrate a few of those points I've made, this is the social gradient of health from the most deprived to the, uh, sorry, the most deprived to the least deprived across the UK. 
and you can see actually the, the differences in life expectancy and um, uh, the, it's a disability measure. You can see that actually from, from one side to the other substantially and in terms of life expectancy you see from around 75 up to 85, so about a 10 years gradient in that. Environmental and planning issues are partly that. It's a very complex feature, but it's certainly got a, a role in that. In terms of access to services, this is a simple map that shows access to train services in Belfast. So the green is within a five-minute walk, and the red is a 10-minute walk. Uh, you can see that as being fairly limited. Clearly, there's, there's public trans other types of public transport system. But actually, it's very limited, and there's a social gradient to that. It's limited access to train services, which are largely seen in, in most medium and large sized cities as an essential service. Belfast is particularly poorly declined on that. But if you take other access, uh, other services, they're far better. This is actually, you could call it a, this is a subway system. But in fact, it's subway uh, sandwiches in this case, which actually you can see access to local services. is a big issue, subway might not be the worst, health uh, outlet, but actually fast food is very, very poor and actually disputed right across the city. And that's why there's been planning issues that have gone into that, which I'll come on to. Just to finish on the health impacts of the built environment, I leave with a, a, a very evocative test that has been adopted in the US and elsewhere. And in the US, it's called the popsicle test. So I've called it for the benefits of, of Northern Ireland, the poke principle. And what this means is a very, very simple term. We're not talking about major technical planning tools. It's a simple tool that would you let a, a child of, say, about six, leave your house unaccompanied, go to the shop, buy an ice cream and a lollipop, and they can come back on their own before the ice cream is melted. Now, how many areas in Northern Ireland does that actually apply? And I'd imagine very, very few why we make 30% um, of the journeys under a mile by car. We, we've, as a result of the car dependency, we're very scared to let our children out alone. So that very one simple principle, I think, is very evocative of where we are and potentially where we could be with the built environment. So to, to move on, I just wanted to focus on the role of the planning system. This is essentially important because at the moment we're treating these health uh, consequences by the NHS, which are essentially treating the symptoms, which is very, very expensive, clearly, and actually we let people get into a miserable state before we, we treat them. If we start to make interventions through the built environment, it's, it's far more preferable because first it's comprehensive in that actually everybody benefits, it's not socially differentiated. If you fix the built environment, everyone that uses that built environment uh, is, benefits from it. It's clearly long-lasting. Our built environment lasts decades, centuries. So actually investment now in it can actually pay off hugely. And it's shown to be cost-effective. And I'll give you an example of that. And why planning is central to achieving this is it, it is comprehensively controls the built environment. As Stephen suggested, you shouldn't be able to build anything without planning permission. So it's an essential test to see if it's health-proof. It takes a long-term perspective. We should, our planners should be looking 15, 20, 50 years ahead. It's used to dealing with complexity and diversity of issues, balancing social, economic, and environmental objectives. It's democratically controlled and participative, so it's not distant experts making those decisions. It's actually open to democratic control. And importantly, it's actually recognized as a very core and useful element to civilized society. It's, people are used to the planning system rather than introducing some new form of regulation. So if we were to think about how we start to make the planning system in Northern Ireland more health, supportive of good health, I've suggested there's nine principles that we can take. The first is actually change that um, part of the Northern Ireland Planning Act, not to just support consistent and orderly development, to, but perhaps actually make health the key priority. I've suggested some wording there that may help. So that would give a very strategic goal for the planning system to be focused on delivering health. And I think that actually then aligns with what the current programme for government is trying to do, which is align it to outcomes. It links the planning system with actually out, outcomes on, uh, on for society. There's a second tier of things that we need to do to make sure planning is health-led. 
And in the briefing paper, I discuss these in a lot more detail. But things like health becoming a material consideration, so planners have to consider it uh, when considering planning applications. That actually, like other places have done, you put actually public health within planning teams. So every planning application is sort of uh, discussed by a public health expert as well as a transport engineer. Health impact statements. We need to adopt minimal standards for access to green space, access to social facilities, and so on. So that, again, uh, is an outcomes-driven approach. We probably need training for planners and counselling. We need to restrict poor health developments, and I include fast food outlets and many other things from that. And we need to maybe learn from good practice. And an example of this is the NHS in England, for example, has launched 10 demonstrators of healthy new towns. So actually the NHS is actually getting involved with a, a whole range of, of public developments to see if they could, because they recognize that they could sell, save costs over the long term. We don't have any such good flagships like that in Northern Ireland. And this is an example of more and more local governments, particularly in Scotland, are actually adopting how to limit hot food takeaways and where they could be appropriately located. Uh, for example, away from school gates, it makes it uh, an issue. So there are things that you can do with the planning system already if you want to. The other main issues would be to get serious about car dependency. In Northern Ireland, for 15 years, it's well, over 15 years, it's been government policy to reduce car use, and during that time, it's got big, higher and higher. So actually, we're not being serious about this. It's a government objective. We're not being serious. Northern Ireland has the highest rates of commuting by car in the UK, 81% compared to the UK average of 68%. And even that pales into significance when we look at some other European societies. So this is a very, very serious problem for us. And it's probably related to air quality. It's related to um, accidents. It's related to um, so, uh, community severance. It's related to inactivity and obesity. So of all the things, I think this is a very, very major issues. And we've had the, what we've had, I suppose, is planning policy that of particularly uncontrolled, largely uncontrolled building in the countryside that has just compounded and compounded car dependency. We're in a very tricky situation, which essentially is a vicious circle of things. So we, we need to do that. There's a major issue of costs that we're all paying for that in many ways. Uh, low density development and all those health issues are substantial costs that we're, we're uh, bearing because of that. Um, uh, to achieve that, we probably, on the one hand, which is very unpopular, we need to discourage car use. Uh, we could consider congestion zoning. Uh, we could consider reducing parking in our major cities by 1% or 2% every year until we do it. And as we've seen in, in many other societies, we put our society on a road diet where we actually start to, to narrow roads and so on, actually start to remove road capacity gently over time to discourage car pay. If we were serious, we'd be doing that. And clearly, we need a positive side to encourage alternatives, so more public transport investment, reducing car-generating developments in greenfield sites, and encouraging active travel, which is my next point. So actually, while we've been trying to discourage car use, uh, we own, up till 2014, we only spent 54 pence per person on cycling every year. Uh, while London, for example, was paying £18, pounds, the Netherlands, £25. Pounds. That actually has tipped the balance quite substantially since 2005. We're spending about £4. Pounds but still 85% of our transport spending is on roads. And with the government objective of reducing car dependency, that really doesn't, there's quite a contradiction there. So we've got to invest more in that. We've got to make walking and cycling safer, pedestrian facilities and so on. We need long-term strategies for towns and cities to increase density, uh, land use mix and so on. And actually we need to somehow incorporate cost savings that we get from um, uh, walking and cycling into our benefits. So an example of this is a bit of work done uh, by the School of Public Health in Queen's which looked at the Conswater Greenway, which I'm sure you're all aware of. It's costing something like 30, 40 million pounds. And this bit of modelling suggested that actually if only 2% of the population of East Belfast started to get more physically active as a result of the Greenway, it would pay for itself. So immediately, not only just making economic savings, as well as the savings to, to welfare. Clearly, you would anticipate that such a well-designed scheme, and that actually might 
actually increase more. So you could potentially get a 10% increase. You'd have very major savings. So really, we need some sort of economic model that encourages that uh, and discourages car-inducing uh, developments. The other things we need to do is rediscover planning at the neighbourhood level. If you can plan where you can get, do most of your shopping, access community facilities, schools and so on within a 10-minute walking level, you find that 85% 80, of people would, would walk during those activities. This was a, a core principle of early planning. But we've just simply lost it. If you think of how we've built in the, the countryside or even on suburban areas, we just don't plan in terms of a, at the neighbourhood level. There's a whole number of things we can do with that about clustering services, uh, having very minimal access uh, thresholds, uh, and actually adopting minimal uh, thresholds for this. For example, an ideal healthy community would have toddler's play areas everywhere within 100 metres, allotments within 200 metres, playgrounds, and so on. That actually does need a lot of planning and an increasing in densities compared to what we're doing at the minute, but it is possible. And if we have this, uh, experience has shown that actually you'd probably get 80, of 90, 80 to 90% of kids going to school and other, other benefits like that. We need to integrate environmental health with planning. We often see those are very different. So actually seeing planning as the first line of defence against pollution, so identifying where there's local environmental thresholds that might be uh, going, and actually using in a more productive way strategic environmental assessment and environmental uh, impact assessment. And finally, um, the, the last three, um, we need to make places greener. That seems a little bit obvious, but since 1938, the National Playing Fields Society has been suggesting that we should have a, what they call a six-acre standard. That translates to actually 2.4 hectares of playing fields or open space per 1,000 people. That's there, but we haven't actually uh, enforced that for a long time. And actually identifying these access, the things I showed in the previous thing about the toddler's play area, allotments, and so on, so everybody benefits from that. Clearly, at the moment, they're very unequally distributed across our society. And in terms of inequalities, if we have to invest, we can actually gain far more by investing in those places that are currently um, in most need and suffering most environmental injustices. Positive schemes like age uh, and child-friendly cities help to identify those, those inequalities. And again, this enforcing of minimal standards through the planning system, which it can do best, it's a regulative mechanism, can help in achieving this. I won't go into community engagement. There's a whole side on that for planning for health, but clearly, like all good planning, that's an essential component. So I'll end just by presenting this quite evocative quote by Jan Gell, who is seen as, I suppose, the, the father or the grandfather now of people-centered planning. And just by looking at the one quote, I think that gives an insight why perhaps Denmark as a a healthier and happier population. Okay, thank you very much.